Son of God. Okay, I have checked with the people at the Wilshire. I do not get attendance credits for canines. So I'm very happy to have the dog here, whosoever dog it is. But I'm just not going to be able to claim credit for it on my report form. So there you go. Um, uh, today's an interesting day. Hi, everybody. Uh, today's an interesting day. A lot of days are interesting days. I see Susie and Merle. I see Barbara. I see Mara and an empty chair. Yeah, OK. I see Effie, Jim, Steve. I got a note from Mona that she wouldn't be there, and she's there, so I am very confused. Oh, no, that was that. I won't be there on August twenty seventh. Oh, then I should. I, okay, I'll start worrying about it then. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, good to see. You. Where's the baby? What did you do with the baby? <laughs> he just left her at Costco. Shabbat shalom. You left her at Costco. Okay. Uh, Rebecca, hi, Rebecca, Cindy. Hi. Hi, Gary. Good to see you. Herman. Hi, Larry. Marina. Saw you last night. Mary. Howard. Eric. Barbara. Lynn. Hi, Ray. Karen. Joseph. Uh, Helen. Helen. Uh, we're just we're doing. Oh, okay, Harv. We get credit for you now. Um, one last time, and we're going to move on. If you have not ever done so, and if you think you may not have sent it, it's not a problem. Send me your email address so that you know our, our roster can be kept up to date. Wow, what a busy weekend this is. Busy weekend. <clears throat> Friday, September 5th. Excuse me, that's stupid. Friday, it's October, it's August, I know. Friday, the 15th of Av, Tuba Av, Jewish Love Day. Friday, we loved everybody. Uh, that's one thing. And today, I am somehow, <clears throat> I have to get a drink. Friday, Saturday, today, is Shabbat Nachamu. N-A-C-H. A-M-U, Nachamu, and it is the Sabbath of consolation, which we read for the Haftarah, Isaiah chapter 40, um, and we'll, we will do all of that. Uh, we're alone, right? And, <clears throat> and I can speak with you, trusting that you don't, you know, relay things. The Nachamu in Shabbat Nachamu is in the imperative. It's not in the warmly supportive. Nachamu, Nachamu Ami means go out and comfort my people. So many people, of course you're Herman. Herman just sent a weird email or whatever. Yeah, he sent. Herman, you are always a part of us. And just give me your email address, please. Thank uh, you. Well, I'll think it over. If I change my mind, I'll let you know. Okay. The, okay. So when it says Nachamu, Nachamu Ami, it isn't saying to the Jewish people, be comfortable. It's saying, go out and comfort others, okay? And I cannot begin to tell you how many rabbis have never met an imperative in Hebrew that they understood, okay? So we're gonna just let it go with that. And so the whole idea, Isaiah, the whole idea is after all that Israel has gone through, the prophet, and all the people to whom the prophet speaks being told, comfort the Israelites. Make them feel better. God is there. Everything's going to be okay. That's the message of Shabbat Nachamu. And to mention that there are 
seven Shabbatot between today and Rosh Hashanah. How about that for scary? Yeah, it is. <laughs> there are th there are seven. They're called the seven Sabbaths of consolation, and and today is the first of the seven. And when we're done, I, I'm too fun. The cat does not replace the baby you left in Costco. Well, okay. Titi was my first baby. Mm. I, I get that. <laughs> Okay, so I want to read with you just a few lines. Uh, in, it's only in the plout, um, and it's in two, 1224 in the plout, um, and it's not in the other versions, but it's the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 21 to 26. I, I want to, the stuff is beautiful. It's a beautiful, beautiful text. And let me just read it without comment, then we'll move on. Hello, Tedu, hello, Tishmao. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Were you not told from the beginning? Have you not grasped how the world began? It is God enthroned beyond the horizon in whom we all seem like grasshoppers. It is God who spread out the heavens like a curtain, stretches them like a tent to live in, bringing princes to naught, making earth's rulers as nothing. Scarcely as they planted, hardly sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in earth when God blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them away like rubble. Verse 23. To whom then will you compare me? Who is my equal, says the Holy One. This is beauty. Lift up your eyes on sea. See who created the stars. The one who leads out their hosts by number, calls them each by name. By whose great might and vast power, no one is missing. That's Isaiah chapter 40. It's pure, pure comfort. Know that God is in charge. It will be okay. Now, testing your biblical knowledge. This is a text so similar to another major, major text in the third section of the Bible. I'm giving a little bit of a hint. When the answer to all of the problems is God is present in control, awesome, infinite. God has the answers. Anyone want to guess? Uh, right, five, four, three, two, one, nothing here. It's a shame I was giving away a key to a Tesla. That's not going to happen today. Uh, <laughs> The book of Job, the last chapters of the book of Job, God says to Job, who are you questioning? Do you know anything? I make the animals wander and I know when they give birth and the heavens and the earth, it's filled with exactly the same description of the awesome power of God. So chapter 40, in Isaiah is a major chapter in the whole Bible. And it reflects a theme found uh, in the book of Job, in the book of Job. Uh, so let's hold on to that. We could ask ourselves a question. Do you find Isaiah's words a source of comfort for you personally? <laughs> Do they touch you? The awesome, infinite power of God making all that is in the universe function. From the stars to the worms. This is, this is major. By the way, I, I know that Effie is listening in, but... Uh, 
Bible scholars tell us that there are probably five authors brought together in the book of Isaiah. Starting chapter 40, we have an author whose name, scientists are great, is called Second Isaiah. That's, that's great. So the second author in the book of Isaiah is called Second Isaiah. We don't have his name. Um, but his work, the writings of Second Isaiah, are the undergirding of much of the messianic teaching of Judaism. Okay? I, second Isaiah is powerful, beautiful, and really influence us, influences us in so many ways that we don't even think about because his description of the relationship between God and the universe is like standard. Now, you remember last week we read chapter one of Isaiah how bitterly critical and angry that Isaiah was, right? Well, guess what? Isaiah too could never have done that. His love, his devotion, very, very different. We're going to stop with that. It's good. Um, let's just check in. We have, again, fabulous number of people here today. It's good to be with you. Um, Checking in, does anyone want to share with us uh, anything going on in your lives, uh, anything that, that we should be aware of? Because we are a community, not just a group of people in a class. Um, anything going on, celebrating concerns? Uh, I'm not going to pick out any names, but if you wish to offer, uh, we're here. Okay. Nothing much happening. I see Mona. Um, I just wanted to share with the group that the journal that published a uh, poem of mine is now available on Amazon. It's American Writers Review, uh, the current 2022 issue. And it's actually a lovely um, journal that has nonfiction, fiction, artwork, photographs, and one little poem called My Father by Mona. <laughs> Actually, I had a question Fabulous. going back to the last comment. If yeah. Isaiah is the basis of a lot of our messianic teachings, do you second Isaiah? Second Isaiah, do we see a lot of it essentially repeated in some form in Christianity? Totally. I mean, Steve, not even lightly. Second Isaiah is big in the eschatological visions of, of Christianity. Sure. Yeah, he provides the language, the images, his love for God, uh, astonishing, beautiful. And I guess love and awe, both there. Yes, thank you for that. Anyone else need to want to check in with anything? Uh, okay, please, Merle. I just need to take a grandmother's bragging moment that Gabby just changed dance studios to a more professional dance studio. So if you see me spending time being on classes in my car, it's because Sharon can't be in two places at once with two different children in two different places. So um, Arnie got Sasha duty this morning, but we're checking out this studio, which is way more for Gabby to grow more. So we're very <laughs> excited. She's very excited. And um, it will get her away from just basic standard stuff. So okay. I'm just bragging because I need to. Okay, you understand the rules of this community. When she becomes a professional, we all get free tickets. But not but, a problem. Okay. I just, <laughs> you know, if, if on, on the professional level, if you all want to travel to Europe this in May with this TAP group, Feel free to go that, you know, the more chaperones they have, the happier they'll be. <laughs> okay. So that's great. That's it. I'm checking in. We're all good. Okay. Excellent. Okay, great. Uh, calendar, Jim, this evening. Yes. Um, 
This evening we have Secrets and Lies we're going to discuss. This is a British film from 1996, but it's one of uh, Mike Lee's best films. He directs in a very natural style. If you want to learn more about it, there's a great interview with him uh, and Charlie Rose and the two actors who feature in this film. Uh, it's about a black woman who introduces herself to her birth mother, who thought the child who was white, who thought the child she gave up was white. And after the shock and awe of that uh, oh. news uh, reaches her, it's a story of a growing relationship and how the family begins to accept her after a lot of difficulty. Uh, it's a, a lovely film, very moving, very funny, nothing to be afraid of told from a very natural point of view nothing is hyper dramatized so it's called secrets and lies um, on hbo max uh the interview is uh, just look up charlie rose on youtube for mike lee l-e-i-g-h and uh, hopefully uh, that'll prepare you to talk about the film at 7 30 tonight and you can pick up the link for that on the uh, info at wbtla.com um, or email me at jimruxson at yahoo.com and I'll send you all the information. Super. Thank you. Thank you very much. Always, Jim. Thank you. Great stuff. Um, uh, Cindy, where are you? I just. There. Yeah. So um, we started our monthly happy hours in person. Um, Diane was there. Susie was there. Lynn was there. It's just a lovely social evening to get to know each other. Um, Susie can talk when I'm done. We're going to be starting our Shabbat dinners at Froman's and Susie could talk about that. Our ongoing honey sales are going on and Lynn is our chair of that. We're having a Zoom happy hour. Um, it's called Armchair Adventures. We're going to feature Vienna September 8th at five o'clock. Everyone is invited to that. Um, it's just going to be the history, the sites, the Jewish history of Vienna. And then on September 16th, we're having a Sukkot celebration at Irmas. We're having a special guest speaker fly in from New York. Um, happens to be related to our rabbi. And everyone will be invited to that. It will be a lunch at the Irmas okay, campus. Cindy? Yes. Cindy? Cindy, you froze. Yeah. I didn't hear what you said about Sukkot. I'm sorry. Oh, That's Sukkot, serious. we're it's having a special experience. guest speaker fly in from New York. Oh, good. Okay. As in your daughter. Yeah, I mean, that that, that will be good. So we're very excited about the timing Actually, worked out, and we're very excited to have her. That's going to be a program. But the, the women of uh, Wilshire and the Sisterhood, that's, that's super Thank you, thank you for that. Okay. Uh, Can I just say one thing, Rabbi? Yes. yes Susie please. wants to talk about Fromans. If you just take one second. Okay, please, August, Fromans, but we have to move on. Quick on Fromans. August 26th at six o'clock, we're having a Shabbat dinner at Fromans, no host. You can bring as many guests as you wish. All you need to do is email or call me and let me know that you can come. Thank you, Susie4433 at AOL.com. Thank you. Okay, Susie4433 at AOL.com. Uh, okay, uh, would someone please send a note to Doris Rubelson? She's having trouble connecting. Would someone, will, raise your hand if you're willing to do that, just to send a note to her with the link. Uh, anyone? Willing to do that, please. Uh, and okay, I see a note from Too Fun. Our screenplay, Asylum, which is based on my life as a child refugee in the 80s, advanced to the quarterfinals of the Oscars Academy Nickel Fellowship Screenwriting Competition. Wow. My and I co wrote it. Hmm. Whoa. Yeah. Ten years of rejections, and uh, this this is such a surreal moment for us. Wow. Uh, w w when are the quarterfinals? When do you know whether you advance? Well, they, they haven't released the quarterfinals. We just got an email, and um, in the next month or so, we'll find out if we advance to semifinals or the finals. But just being 
selected to the academy is a win for us. It's a huge win. Uh, I well, I am very impressed. Good luck. Thank you Good so much. Good luck. Fantastic. Okay. The uh, the last checking in that I'd like to do important here uh, is the name of this week's sedra. And the name, if you if you go back to eleven eighty eight, uh, which is just Deuteronomy chapter three verse twenty three. It says, Ve'et Hanan el Adonai, I pleaded with God saying, God, let me live. Let me find a way to get into the promised land, right? We know that story, right? Not a big deal. It's all, it's all there, old story. We know it. I wanted to point out the word Ve'et Hanan. I'm sorry, Donna Shapiro is not here, but maybe, you know, we can get a message back to her uh, that, uh, the Et Hanan says more than I pleaded with the eternal. From my perspective, when I read the word, it says I pleaded. Et Hanan, yeah. The root, as I understand it, is Chen. Is Chet Hanan. Chen. By the way, it's a lovely name in Israel, though I know a number of women named Chen. It's, it's a great name. But the translation is grace. The Et Hanan says, Moses is saying to God, I don't deserve it, but as an act of grace, let me get into the land. To me, that is so much richer than I pleaded with God. Okay? It's a little point. But when I hear Ba'et Hanan, it's not just more fetching. Moses is saying, I know. I have screwed up. I have done wrong. I have been fulfilled. I know that. I know that I'm not deserving. But God, even as I am not deserving, please let me go into the land. And somehow that makes a difference for me. I mean, it's just a small point, okay? But it, it makes a difference for me. Now, I have, did someone send a note to Doris? Someone send a note to Doris Verbalson? Uh, okay, then I've been trying to get on for a half hour and I finally did it. I don't know what was going on today. Oh, now. you're here. Okay. Hi, okay. Uh, who's that? <laughs> so Doris sent me a note. And I just want to reference it because it's 53 years ago today that Sandy Koufax retired. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. And even though my team was American League, no booze, and <laughs> Cleveland, no booze. That was my team. Sandy Koufax was a giant in yeah. my life. Okay? Yeah. And, and so Doris wants us to, you know, look up, go Google some stuff on, on Koufax. Uh, he made a huge difference in the world. I sent you something. You got it. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I am. I am holding it right here. Good, good, good. Um, I thought you'd enjoy it. Yeah. it uh, yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, okay. Then a totally different thing that I want to leave you with. Boy, could we have a weekend retreat on this topic? How many of you have ever heard of Edith Stein? Edith Stein. I see three hands. Four, five. Oh, okay. Do we have a volunteer who'd like to explicate? Mona's waving like mad. Okay. <laughs> Mona's an expert on Edith Stein. I'm oh. waving like mad because I wrote a full length play about her. Edith Stein was born in 1891. She was the youngest daughter in a large, close knit Orthodox uh, 
Jewish family. Uh, she was born in Upper Silesia and grew up in Breslau. Um, she had a uh, she was a she was a questioner, a quester. She got a PhD in philosophy at a time when very few people went to very few women went to university, much less got PhDs. She had a mystical experience, converted to Roman Catholicism, and as the Nazis were growing in power um, and en enacting the Nuremberg Laws, what did dear Edith, the uh, much beloved youngest child in her family, do? She entered a cloistered convent. Mm -hmm. um, she got taken away in 1941 as one of the so-called Catholic Jews and murdered at Auschwitz. The church, in an attempt to um, have reconciliation between uh, Catholic and Jewish communities, not realizing exactly how this would play out, made her a saint in the 1970s, uh, understandably annoying <laughs> a number of Jews who felt that of the six million who perished, why did they pick the apostate? Um, but she's a, within Catholicism, she's a symbol of tremendous piety, humility, modesty, and um, enormous um, mystical power. And she was a really, really fascinating woman, a feminist, um, very, very loving daughter and, and uh, sister. And uh, I wrote a play about her. <laughs> really? Oh, that's great. <laughs> okay, so thank you for that. Uh, boy, I opened up an easy question, right? Anyone know Edith Stein? Yeah, I guess so. Um, she was sent to the gas chambers August 9th, 1942, which is why she's being mentioned today. Okay? She was sent to the gas chambers August 9th, 1942. Uh, the opposition from the Jewish community was that she was sent to the gas chambers as a Jew, not as a Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, she died because of her Jewish origins and in the process became a Catholic saint. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a mass at Auschwitz this week conducted by uh, a Roman Catholic cardinal, Michael Cherney. Mm -hmm. uh, why did they ask Cherney? Uh, because his grandparents converted from Judaism to Catholicism. And some of them died in Theresen and other camps. So the Catholic Church took someone whose family converted from Judaism to Catholicism, suffered death in the Holocaust, to honor Edith Stein who converted to Catholicism and died in the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And that's just it. It's a datum. It's a thing. Uh, it's the debate over Edith Stein is wrapped up in the debate over the Pope at the time, and how the Pope did or did not respond to the needs of the Jewish people, um, Pius XII. I, I don't know what to do with it. Uh, it just is. We should be aware of it because in within the Catholic world, as Mona properly stated, Edith Stein is a major figure, a major figure. And it hasn't been easy for the Jewish community to relate to the celebration of this woman as a saint and so forth. Uh, I, I am going to stop here. It just, it, thank you. When I'm, thank you. Confused, thank you. My privilege is to share it with you so that you can be confused too. Sure. Um, yeah. If anyone wants to offer a word, not a lecture, uh, but a word about Edith Stein, um, 
or about Sandy Koufax, we can we can just take a minute. Howard? I would just wonder what would, I have no idea, uh, would be the reaction of the Catholic Church if a Jewish, prominent Jewish mo movement celebrated the conversion of a Catholic prelate church official to Judaism? And who became, let's say, a rabbi? Well, you know, they probably, though this is so rude, why did I think of the God, you touched a bad note in me. I was thinking they'd serve, you know, a buffet with corned beef and cheese on top. I, I don't know. Uh, uh, forgive me, Howard, that was snarky. But okay, thank you for that. Any, any other comments on either Sandy Koufax or Edith Stein? Anything else, Mona? I just wanted to say quickly, she wrote a letter to Pius um, uh, asking him to condemn the behavior of the Nazis as unchristian. Right around that time, the, uh, a series of Dutch uh, bishops had denounced um, the behavior of the Nazis from their respective pulpits. They got taken away. Um, Pius responded to Edith Stein by uh, issuing a papal benediction for her family, but he did not take the broader action that she had requested. The letter was found in the archives. One of Pius's secretaries said that he was very concerned that any greater response as she had requested would have really endangered a number of people um, uh, including bishops in the Catholic Church. The, the bishops who were taken away were um, in the Netherlands, which was occupied. Okay, thank you for that. I, it's Shabbos, I'm keeping myself trying. I wanna move on to the Torah text, but Cindy, absolutely. Then let I'll me try to it. be quick. Um, one of my clients had mentioned to me that he played minor league baseball, in fact, with Sandy Koufax. And I said, please tell him my son playing club soccer refused to play on a playoff game and was severely criticized by his Catholic coach mm -hmm. and using Sandy as an example, stood by him and refused to play. And the next time I saw my client, he brought me an autographed baseball for my son. Oh. And I'm really glad that the message got to him that he still is an inspiration to Jewish children. Thank you very much. I have a note from tomorrow. Good Catholics have been confused by Jewish responses. <laughs> They're trying to be inclusive. It, it, it actually, thank you, tomorrow. It's, it's a point of friction. It, it's like we can't communicate with each other. The church is viewing, celebrating Edith Stein as, as a way of bridging gaps. And for a lot of Jews, it's a way of pouring salt on a wound. So it's it's either one or the other, and thank you for that. Now let's go to. Uh, there's so much to talk. We we really should have a retreat weekend. Start with four, chapter four, verse one. The Plowed, eleven eighty eight. Uh, women mm -hmm. reform Judaism, ten sixty six. Here's a question for everyone here today, and it's so good to see all of you. And remember, please, I need your email addresses from all of you. Please, please, please. Just send me an email address, okay, so that I have you on my list. Now, folks, what's more important, studying or doing? Doing. Uh, both. Oh, yeah. Both, yeah. Both, both doesn't work. We are doing. 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 We take sides doing. here. Studying. Okay. Doing. Doing. doing for the right reason. <laughs> Splitting hairs. Okay. A Jewish lawyer has spoken. Thank you. <laughs> you. You cannot do unless you study what to do. Mm, no. no. <laughs> but how do you know what to do? Be somebody by thinking, can, by somebody feeling, can tell by you. studying. Yeah. It's true, yes, we, studies are part of it. We are back 2,000 years ago into the rabbinical <laughs> academies where the exact same thing happened. The exact same thing happened. What you did and what the rabbis did 2,000 years ago, welcome to the crowd. This was, I'm sorry, I, well, I guess it is taped somewhere. It's beautiful. 
Look at this. Uh, chapter 4, verse 1. And now, O Israel, Shema El Hakukim, give heed to the laws and rules I'm instructing you to observe so that you may live to enter and occupy the land that the eternal your God has given you. Okay. There is a statement in the Talmud that says, Lo Hamidrash Ikar Ela Hamaaseh. It's not the study that counts, it's the deed. Heed. Okay, that seems to be pretty much a rabbinic position, which is backed up by 7,000 books, all saying that an ignoramus needs to study before they can reach status of being a pious Jew. So the rabbi said it, lo hamidrashikar elahama aseh, but it burned in them. Uh, yeah, we're on 1188 in the plout, in the new plout. That's what I have. In where? Where? In what section? Deuteronomy hmm. chapter 4, verse 1. Deuteronomy. Oh, that's what I'm trying to find. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. So then, that's really important. Uh, well, let me just go forward into this. The reward for doing the right thing is what? Because this is really important. What does it say? Verse, chapter four, verse one. Give heed to the laws. What? So that what? You can enter the Holy Land. What is that saying about the Jewish presence in the Holy Land? What's it saying? Dependent on good behavior. Dependent. Uh, okay, Harv? Is that where you go? I was going to say the same thing. Okay. So it is conditional. Folks, our possession of the promised land is conditional. Nowhere does God say, I'm giving it to you forever because that's the way things are in the world. It is conditional. Conditional upon what? Following the laws. Steve Miller, yes. I actually have two questions. Um, the first is, if it's conditional, um, doesn't that kind of give some ammunition to Palestinians who want us out of the land, who can claim to cite to how we don't follow the word of God, even as we understand it. And my second question is in the next verse, um, how do you reconcile, you can't add or subtract with how we interpret the text, especially as modern reformed Jews? Okay, Steve, I'm going to call you out of order and slam my gavel down. I've been waiting to do that. I can answer your first question, but we haven't gotten to the other verse yet. So, <laughs> out of order, take your seat. I love it. Okay, now, uh, and, and Sukasa raises the question, wouldn't the Palestinians say that we broke this covenant, right? So it's the same question. It's the same question. Answer, they're right. If the possession- That's not helpful. <laughs> okay, well, I'll go for a different answer then. Um, if the possession of the land is conditional upon our being observant of the laws, what does it say? Observe so that you may live to enter. Give heed to the laws and the commandments. And in that phrase, laws and commandments, we know already means the laws, the reasons for which you understand and other things which you don't understand. God doesn't care. If you understand, that's part of the game, but do them. Do them. If not, you don't deserve to be in the land. There is another statement in the Gomorrah, because of our sins, rabbis taught, we were kicked out of the land. So, because of our sins, we were kicked out. If we're not observant, we don't belong. What 
What is our response to that? Shut up and eat your ice cream. Response. It's, well, how do we handle that? Any thoughts? Howard? Well, the consequences, if we don't behave properly in the future, will be kicked out again. That's what the Torah says. That not only did it happen then, it very likely could happen now. If we fail to be observant of what the Torah is teaching, we lose claim to the land. Any other thoughts? Okay, I'm hoping this is as distressing to you as it is to me. Okay, Merle. Uh, I'm thinking, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking of now versus now here and probably also in Israel. But I'm thinking that do people really, I mean, how observant are people? I know people who claim to be so Jewish, yet they observe nothing. You know, they, their definition of observing high holidays is, or Passover even worse, I think, is going to a restaurant that has a Seder, but no service, just the food. So, I mean, I look at people now, it's kind of like post-bar mitzvah syndrome. Were you observant until your child became a bar about mitzvah? And then you said, okay, it's not important anymore. So I'm conflicted with the definition of observance and losing your land or your whatever, you know, how is God going to kick you out? But I see these people wandering around and they don't seem to care, nor do they support their definition of supporting and being observant is supporting organizations other than what synagogues might do for them. Okay. By the way, you know this, I've said it before, but it keeps coming to mind because it was burned into my head. When I was an undergraduate member of my fraternity, one of my fraternity brothers, Jewish guy, became a doctor. Of course, he was a Jewish guy. Uh, we would have our meals in the fraternity house and we would bring during Passover lots of things, right? And Jim would bring ham sandwiches on matzah. And he did. And it's a good thing I was not judgmental. Actually, the good thing is I was never really all that physical. Otherwise, I would have killed him. <laughs> uh, but but the, yeah, I mean, OK. I, I could say, Merle, that there are two sides to the problem. A covenant is a two-way street. Lately, yeah. God hasn't been doing God's part either. May I just point out? Okay. So, okay. God, you got us. You want to kick us out of the land. Oh, by the way, uh, how how were the 40s uh, in the divine kingdom, the 1940s? Well, you know, is that okay? Uh, you know, maybe maybe you 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 were on vacation or something. Okay, I I see. And by the way, the sarcasm involved in that is intentional. <laughs> no, it's intentional. <laughs> Definitely, we have a covenant. We've messed up, but God, by the way, I don't want to compare how you messed up compared to how we messed up. Okay. I think God is confused by everyone's behavior at this point. Yeah, poor God needs a Jewish shrink. Okay. <laughs> we, we were brought back from Babylonia. And I, I would guess that everyone was not... Um, hearkening unto the statutes and the ordinances at that time. So it suggests to me that there is some leeway <laughs> in terms of everyone being observant. And, and the other thing I would say is that there doesn't seem to be any time constraint on this. So the notion of 
are continuing to struggle to, to observe still seems worthwhile and appropriate. Okay, well, Mara, before I get to Larry, I just see you standing next to Abraham saying to God, okay, so there are not 50 righteous people. What if they're 40? God, come on. You know, don't be such a stickler for numbers. 30, God, hey, 30, 30 is a number, right? And, and you'd be supporting Abraham and that. And then finally, what does God do? Tells him to shut up. Okay, but really, that's what God says. Larry. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I was going to say something similar. It, it's not like God has all that many great alternatives for others to occupy the land. I mean, those historically who kicked the Jews out weren't that great shakes either. The only the only difference, Larry, I would I would say is that the others don't claim as a people to have a covenant with God to have a con contractual relationship. Uh, and, and we have committed on the one hand, God has committed on the other hand. As a Zionist, I have absolutely no trust that it was God who reestablished the Jewish state. That's not part of my faith. My uncle, his generation, the Chalutzim that came from Europe, who died, who fought, who did. The Americans, and not to dis disagree that it's important, who donated money and used political contacts and supported, and the people who found guns and arms in Czechoslovakia in 1945 to get over to Israel because no one would help them. They established the state. The question I have is not whether God is going to do what this text says, because I don't believe that that's what happens. But I believe that under this text is a statement. We are not just a political entity. If the Jewish people has possession of its ancient home, it's got to be other than the home of 190 other nations in the world. We have a right to expect more, to demand more, not because I live in dread fear that God's going to cast us out, though that's what it says here, but that we lose an ethical mandate for the lives we claim to live. That's a different ballgame. That's very different. I don't think God cast us out. I don't think God brought us back. I think faith in God kept us going. I, I believe a desire for the Jewish people not to be kachol hagoyim like everybody else. We don't see ourselves as everybody else. But when we act like everybody else, we lose a lot. And so my expectations for the Jewish people, thus my expectations for the state of Israel are very high. I cringe when a Jewish Ghana makes the front page of the New York Times. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay? It's, it's, I, I suspect that Catholics, Protestants, Muslims, whatever, don't cringe when a member of their religious community is arrested for something. But every Jew is a member of the Jewish people, and the Jewish people must be more than just kachol hagoyim like everybody else, or it's not worth the struggle to be different. To be different just to be different is expensive. To be different so as to create a different world is a calling. And I'm in that second part. 
Tamara, well, I'm sorry, Tamara, what would you like to say? Lost you. Okay. Wrong, wrong, wrong button. Uh, I, I'm, I'm saying to Deuteronomy is the one book in the Torah that has a clear vision of how a society should function. It has a political agenda uh, of how to construct. As somebody says, it's about uh, body politics, um, and it has laws to create a, a, a reasonably equitable society. And what, what it says again and again, if you don't follow this, you can't survive in society with doggy dogs. People treat each other badly and don't have clear sense of solidarity and mutual support. It's not going to make it. Yes, and that Deuteronomic aspect resonates with me, okay? The purpose of all these laws is not to keep God smiling. That's why I have trouble with the Untana Tokef and the High Holy Days. I'm not worried that God's going to send another plague or a disease or a crusade or whatever it is. I am worried that our behavior destroys our warrant to call ourselves a people with a mission. That's what I worry about. People want to be like everybody else? Cool. Cool. There are 7 billion of you. Be like everybody else. That's fine. That's not been who we Jews are. We are not seeing ourselves kuchol hagoyim. And Larry, that's, that's, that's what grabs me. That's what grabs me. I do. I live in absolute no fear of God kicking us out of the land. I live in absolute fear that the people running the state of Israel today don't understand that what they are doing could destroy the state. That's what I fear. Woo! That, um, that echoes back to the earlier part of Isaiah that we read last week. Well done. I like when the strands are connected. Yes, that's Isaiah 1. You massively screwed up. Guess what? You're going to pay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Then, then, uh, uh, I'm going to try to grab a little bit more. This stuff is it's Deuteronomy. It's so wonderful. It's great. Um, you, uh, Steve, wanted to make a reference to you shall not add anything to what I command or take away from it, but keep the commandments. And th there is a wonderful Gomorrah. Uh, it says here, Folks, the Torah come. Yes, Joseph Perling, Tzedek, 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 Justice, justice shall you pursue. Yes, that's our game. Now, God is saying, it comes from me. Because the Torah text says, because I taught this stuff to you. God is telling them, God wants it to be very clear. Folks, I am teaching you this. This is not just ordinary human communication. And no should. It's not ordinary commu uh, commu uh, communication like that. Because if it were, call chacham lev yidbar belibolo hosif alehem because if this were strictly human teachings, then every smart person on earth would add to or subtract from what we're doing. It's a nice passage. God says, would you please understand that these teachings are not human? Gotta stop. 
Do I believe that God spoke these words and gave us these teachings? Literally? Directly? Effie's nodding his head vertically. He is answering, yes, I respect you, Effie, as I add, but uh, I do not. I do see in the Torah teachings human beings reaching for the stars. I do see in the Torah teachings people trying to express the best that we know for the society we want to build. And I have to say, most people in the vernacular don't give a damn. Okay? And the Torah text is saying, you've got to care about striving for the best. And if not today, Tomorrow is going to be too late. Okay, a couple of quickies, Merle. I'm not hearing you, Merle. I'm still not hearing you. Uh, okay, I'm back. I I was going to, that's exactly what I was going to say, is that if, if you sit there, I mean, I listen to people who, you know, who, they think they know it all, and yet they don't pursue it, which is what justice justice says, or they don't practice it. And they sit there and they make up whatever excuse they have for not practicing. They, I think they ruin it for the rest of us who do practice and who are observant. I guess practice and observance are the, hopefully the same thing. All right, Merle, to be clear, I'm going to race because it's the end of the hour. Boy, am I not saying that what we need out of this group of the best Torah students in the world, what we need out of our group is everyone turning Hasidic, Haredi, <laughs> ultra-Orthodox. That's not, by the way, wouldn't be a horror. It's not what I'm saying. But the moral teachings and the ritual teachings that hold the community together have to be side by side. We still have to do Pesach if we want to learn Tzedek 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 Okay? We still have to keep Shabbat if we want to be able to say, honor your father and your mother and have it mean something. Okay? Isaiah is never saying, set aside the ritual. Isaiah is saying your ritual is empty if it isn't directed toward building a better world. That's the Jewish approach. That's what's unique to us. Do we have another hand up? Oh, God, I don't want to flee from this Sedra. Don't add, don't subtract to it. How does that work with Reform Judaism, Steve asked? Uh, the good news is that the rabbis added and the rabbis subtracted and the business of adding and subtracting has been going on forever there are radical add adders and subtractors and there are minimal adders and subtractors and living a Jewish life means finding our way through that people say to me how do you how do you reconcile the fact that you violate Shabbat Stanley how do you reconcile the fact that you don't eat meat that's strictly kosher? You'll buy beef from, from a regular butcher. How do you deal with that? I've tried to find my own way. 
I've tried to find a way that allows me to get what I think to be the essence of being Jewish. I don't claim to be an exemplar. I claim to be struggling. I am struggling not for the ultimate preservation of the Jewish people. I am struggling for the ultimate redemption of humankind. And I find that the Jewish path is richly rewarding and supportive of that approach. And I will walk my path and try to get everyone around me to walk their paths toward the same horizon. I don't know if that makes any sense. I don't know. But it's Shabbos. <laughs> That it, every once in a while, I am motivated by people who say, oh, Stan, we need an hour and a half. Oh, Stan, can't we? No. But this Sedra, folks, with the Shema, with the Ten Commandments, with the Vyahafta, in this same Sedra. That's a pretty good Sedra, okay? It's a pretty good Sedra, and there's a lot to do. And we're going to move now to Kaddish. And did I fail to tell you that I love you? And that please send me your email addresses, okay? Send it to me, email. And 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 so because we are getting more people joining us. And it's wonderful. <laughs> That's wonderful. But I just want to be in touch with you. Okay. Uh, to mention the names who have passed away during the previous month. Geraldine Alden, Hermalchul, Winifred Beck, Barbara Lynch Brownstein, Sonny Sanford Brody, Marion Brown, <clears throat> Stephen Chorna, Harold Eisen, Yvette Fisher, Lawrence Judah, Ben oh. Ender, Michael Gittleson, Ellen Coleman, Gertrude Klein, Joyce Stratner, uh, Linsett, Pearl Loderman, Dove Marmor, Helena Migdal, Catherine oh. Mark, Mo Austin, Bobby Pearson. Mentioning, the, mentioning those, the anniversaries of whose deaths have occurred during the past week. Eva Ackerman, Joanne Alfred, Joseph Ansel, Barbara Lerner Barra, David Beagleman, Jack Berman, Gabriel Bazaar, Ashok Rola Bina, Stanley Blatt, Sidney Bogan, Dorothy uh, Cammy Borenstein, Eugene Borson, Billy Burns, Linda Jane Cherry, Jean David Al. Lawrence Deutsch, Murray Dickman, Sam Belenko, Vinnie Drexler, Estelle Drexler, Frank Feller, Anna Julia Benucci de Ferrero. De Ferrero. Evelyn Friedman, Thomas Freeman, Edward Gelb, Elsie Goodman, Sidney Hoffman, Marion Horn, Anthony Amarco, Iran Esther Ishtam, Marie Coleman, David Harry Karsh, Evelyn Kessler, Denise Ellen Corman, Vivian Korn, Michael Krevin, Solomon, David Kugler, Judith Wolf Lee, Lawrence Leonard, William Lerner, Ellis Levy, Esther Levy, Ava Grace uh, Liadowicz, uh, A. Blinker, Sam Lipo, Murray Loderman, Sydney Mayer, Eddie Michaels, Maurice Nahum, Sylvia Oster, Beatrice Polovol, William Paul Tuck, Sylvia Post, Thelma Prince, Teresa Rouse, Gustav Reese, Edith Rogers, Isidore Green Rosenberg, David Rosenthal, Marv Rosendale, Herbert Rubin, Eugene Rubin, Geraldine Salmonson, Leonard Saxon, Ruth Shapira, Walter Schoenfeld, Michael Schwartz, Larry Searman, Jeremy Seidel, Nathan Schaefer, Raquel Shanbrum, Stanley Sherman, Wilfred Shohan, Ida Siegel, Jacob Silver, Lillian Silver, Meryl Silverstein, Meyer Silverstein, Millicent Small, Gilda Spiegel, Gertrude Steinberg, Marion Tashman, Stephen Tomar, Isaac Dorbati, Alice Walker, Rose Wegg, Murray Weinstein, Jack Leban, Yablon, Sumner Yaffe, Alvin Zapersky. I would like now to ask if 
you have additional names to add, please speak their names aloud now or speak them in your hearts. North Toledo. We bear in mind the names of all our beloved departed, those who died in defense of the United States, those who died in defense of the state of Israel, those who died through senseless acts of horror and terror and war, those who have no one to say Kaddish for them. We bear them all in our hearts. We say Kaddish for them together. Yitkadal, May God who makes peace in the high places make peace in our hearts Make peace in our homes. Make peace in the household of Israel. Make peace among all the families and nations of earth. And let us say, Amen. Amen. Thank you for today, everybody. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Can't wait to see you next week. Uh, we'll get back to the rest of my lesson plan next year. Okay. <laughs> Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Thank shalom, you all everybody. for being here. Okay. I don't Have wanna... a wonderful week. I'm hanging up. I don't want to. Okay. There we go. Shabbat, Shabbat shalom, everybody. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.